please welcome Edmundo Ortega. Thanks, Nadine. Kia ora. My full Spanish name is Edmundo Luis Ortega Ford, but the locals know me as Id. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> My presentation today is really the culmination of a couple years of intense working with uh, executives and companies, both large and small. It's really kind of trying to wrap up everything that I've learned with the hope that every executive that I interact with would know this kind of material. So let's dive in. Here are the things I didn't call this presentation. AI is the best thing ever. It's going to solve all your problems. AI is the worst thing ever. It's going to be the end of the world, right? We're going to work for robot overlords. AI is so technical and complicated, you can't possibly understand it. Let me show you how smart I am by saying a bunch of long technical words. Um, the tricky ethics of AI. This is a very, I think, important topic. I'm not going to talk about it today. <laughs> um, how to prompt. How to prompt is also very important. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's very available. I encourage you all to learn that. And finally, 10 gimmicky demos that show off AI. This is a really common thing. Someone comes along, you know, makes this cool toy or trick. It's very impressive. And then you're like, wow, AI is cool. And then you, should, you sort of think like, oh, well, what am I going to do with it, though? So instead, what I'm going to talk about is really about AI readiness. And I, I love this report from Microsoft, and, and you know, they're talking about how to, how to kind of enable adoption of AI in New Zealand. And when they, in the readiness column, they have these three things, clarifying strategies, creating an AI-enabled digital core. Basically, you're getting your team up to speed with AI. And finally, willingness to take risks. I love that. And we're going to talk about it today. So AI is totally overhyped right now. You're probably feeling that. But at the same time, I truly believe that it's going to transform completely everything we do, the way we work, how we deliver products. So how can both of these things be true? Well, AI right now is a huge topic. When I say AI, every one of you probably has a different notion of what that means. And, and it is a lot of different things. Trevina yesterday said the house on the hill, right? We all have a different image of what that means. And so uh, even, even in this conference in the last couple days, we've talked about so many different applications. So I'm going to break some of that down today and try and clarify what those things mean and how they're useful and how you should think about them and how you can start adopting them. Goldman Sachs did a study earlier this year. They said that 300 million jobs just in the US and the Eurozone are going to be destroyed or transformed due to AI. And yet, we, we should expect to see a 7% increase in global GDP solely due to AI technology. I don't know if that's true. I don't know how they, <laughs> how they get these numbers. <laughs> but the clear thing is that the impact is going to be huge. At the same time, what are we seeing in reality? We're seeing all these mistakes. We're seeing all, the, all these in, um, insufficiencies due to AI, right? All these kind of public flops. We're also not seeing a, a huge change in ROI. We're not seeing um, a return on the investment for investors or oftentimes in our own companies. So people are starting to get wary. Is this just, is this just hype? So, What's the deal? I mean, is this going to be the, the sort of life-changing paradigm that Ed says it's going to be? Or is this going to be the next you know, AR or blockchain? We talked about, I talked about this yesterday. I think many of you were in the session, the Gartner hype cycle. And the thing is, uh, we're not in one place on this hype cycle. Different people who have engaged with this technology are in different places on the hype cycle. So it usually starts with this trigger where something really cool happens with technology and we're like, oh my gosh. And then minds, you know, our human minds, our creative minds start to think like, what can we do with that? What, what are the amazing possibilities, right? Uh, and the hype starts to blow up and people start to say, hey, we can make money off this thing uh, and start selling stories about it. But then we start to use it and, and it doesn't live up to our expectations and we're like, oh man, and we kind of have this moment of disillusionment. 
But some people power through, some people keep building, they believe in the potential of the technology, and eventually we learn how to use it. We, we, we build a playbook. We're not there yet, there is no playbook for AI. But Silicon Valley is not waiting around. They've been waiting for this moment. They've been waiting for a big change. And so I feel this every day. I live near San Francisco. I have many, many friends who work in the Valley. And every single company, every single company is all in on AI. So we might not feel it now, uh, but it's only a matter of time, I'm thinking like a year maybe, before it's just integrated into almost everything we do, our cars, our refrigerators, our, you know, every piece of software that we use. It, it, it's, it's such a useful technology at a small level, and it's easy to integrate because the tooling is so good. So it's really happening. And why is it happening? Why are we so, why are we throwing all this effort into it? Because it's been shown to be effective. and and the pace of innovation in the, the bare bones technology itself is kind of mind blowing. So this chart is, I think just four months, it's, it's June to September of 2024, and it's showing the uh, tokens per second in some of these models, the increase in speed. So, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were looking at, uh, I think it says 70 tokens per second, a kind of average speed from some of these models. And now the best models are, and these are, and these are not shitty models, these are like good ones. Um, we're seeing more on the lines of like 120. So almost a doubling of speed in four months from this tech, that's crazy. At the same time, the costs are going down. At the beginning of the year, every conversation I had with a client was about token costs. How much is it going to cost? I don't have those conversations anymore. We just say it's going to be fine. We'll figure out. The cost is just going down through the basement. And it's getting better. This dotted line that's on the top of this slide is uh, measuring human performance. And these colored lines are AI performance, and they're all shooting up towards that line. So this is over, you know, this looks like 10, 12 years on all forms of AI. But the trend is clear. This is a pretty scary slide in some, <laughs> in some ways, but you have to realize that each one of those lines is a very specific task. And so when we kind of narrow the scope of what we want the AI to do, it tends to do better. When we ask for artificial general intelligence, AGI, it doesn't do that well. I personally think we're a long ways off from that world. To take advantage of this, what we're seeing is this hunger for training uh, the models. And to do that, we need a lot of power. So you're seeing Microsoft, Google, OpenAI making nuclear deals, restarting Three Mile Island to get enough power to train these models. I mean, that's the level of investment. We're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars. What does it mean for New Zealand? Uh, this study by Microsoft and Accenture kind of looked towards the future. I think they were looking uh, 10 or 15 years ahead. Um, they see the potential for 15% GDP growth powered just by AI. This is billions of dollars. I think someone yesterday said 26 billion in the, in the next five years or so, and this is looking even further, 76 billion. Uh, accelerating productivity growth. So productivity grows at kind of a slow pace, and we're saying it's going to double the pace of that growth. Um, and 38% task support, what that means is, you know, can I use AI to accelerate my productivity? Can it help me um, do the things that I want to do? And 14% of that is full automation, so just handing off the whole job to AI to have it do it. So I know I've talked to some people who are actually using AI, some people in the audience, and I know you're probably feeling this, right? If you've implemented this and you've got it into production, you're probably nodding your head right now going, yes, there is a lot of potential right here. And it shows because leadership in New Zealand is starting to get the picture, they're starting to get the message. 70% uh, of people, uh, New, New Zealand leaders, are excited about AI's potential. At the same time, 70% have no plans, no fixed plans to implement AI. We, this conference is about changing that. So I hope that you walk away from this event not in that 70% anymore, I hope it flips. I hope there's 30% that have no plans and you know, most of you do. Uh, usage is increasing. This is like personal usage. People are starting to use the models. They use it because there's value. They don't use it because it's fun. It can be fun, <laughs> but they use it because it helps them do their job and it makes, you know, drudge work easier. It makes their output better. Even public agencies are starting to kind of use it warily. Usually they're the slowest movers in any country or any economy, um, but that's good. 
there are still challenges. There's mistrust. You know, is our data safe? Uh, is it going to steal my job? Things like that. There's a slow uptake from users. People are, it's new technology. People don't know how to use it. Um, people are used to doing their job a certain way. And so they don't like the disruption of a new way. It tends to slow them down at first, and then it accelerates them. And the government is not, you know, coming up with a, an amazing plan like Singapore, right? Singapore is all in, they're taking the lead, they're driving the innovation forward. In the US and here in New Zealand, that's not happening. Uh, and even in the EU, they sort of want to be turning the brakes on a little bit. I, I know this sounds like I'm a shill for Spark, but I, I genuinely believe this. I really love that Spark is doing this event and trying to create some momentum to get people understanding what this technology is and understanding that it can deliver value. Um, the reason they're doing that is because in the OECD, it, it just looks like New Zealand's not well positioned, you know, or it, it's not really taking an active stance in doing this. And as Matt Bain said yesterday, hey, we're a small country. We can move quickly. We could turn something that looks like a disadvantage into an advantage. I love that. And I think that's totally true. Someone sent me this uh, ad from Bremworth, uh, a New Zealand company. They created the entire ad using AI, so AI video, generative video. No actual filming. Uh, and it's a beautiful ad. Uh, and they said, you know, using this technology allowed us to make the video much quicker and we could use the savings from the production to get the message out to a broader audience. So it's a small move, but it's, uh, it's cool and it shows, I think this is indicative of the use cases that we might not think of, but there are so many. So when you dive into your own business and you look at, you know, how could I possibly use this, you're gonna have all these little inefficiencies or potential inefficiencies that AI could make a big difference on. And, and this is a leadership moment. This is what I said yesterday, I, I think, you need to understand the tech and you need to understand what, it, what its potential is in order to drive your businesses forward. And, and I'm gonna try and talk about that today. Now, in the last couple of years, I've been, my day job <laughs> full time is trying to get AI to deliver value, full stop. And it is hard. You know, you can create a prototype or a proof of concept it looks cool, it shows that, hey, this might be possible, but then when the rubber hits the road and you have to really integrate it into your systems or make it work reliably for customers, it suddenly gets a lot harder than we ever thought. I'm not the only one feeling this. Most, most uh, POCs never see the light of day, so this, this chart's a little bit hard to read, but it says that 80% of companies only get one of their POCs into production. And the thing is, I think we're looking at a paradigm shift. This technology is different from the technology that we've been implementing in the past. The technology that we've been implementing in the past is logical, it's mathematical, it's right and wrong, it's, it's controllable. And AI is a little less controllable, and it brings up some new trade-offs that we have to deal with, and we're not used to dealing with, this, with these trade-offs. They introduce that risk that that early slide was talking about. And so we tend to kind of pull back and go, ooh, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, and so that shyness to engage, that shyness to play, can shoot us in the foot. But this is like today, 2024, today feels to me as an, I'm an old guy, I'm an old guy, look at my gray beard. Um, it feels to me like 1996. 1996 was when I started my digital career. This is Amazon's website in 1996. So we didn't know how to make websites back then. There was no playbook. We didn't understand what e-commerce was going to become. We didn't know mobile was coming, right? The world was about to change a lot in, in the next sort of five years, really, from 1996 to 2000. It really changed a lot, and that's where we are today. Big changes are coming. So it's a good time. It was a good time for me to get involved at that time. I, you know, I, monkeys with laptops could have been successful as a digital agency, and that's basically what I was in that moment. Now, today we only have a few levers. Now, I, I, you know, AI is a technical topic, but I think this is a level that we can all understand. And if you don't know this stuff, I mean, take a picture of this slide. I give you this is a homework assignment. I want you, I want you to feel comfortable talking about all these topics. 
If you can talk about these topics on a conversational level, you will be an amazing leader. I'm gonna go through each one of them right now. Machine learning, good old fashioned AI. Raw LLMs, this is Gen AI, the new tech. RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. I'm gonna go through these in a sec, but I'm just listing them out. Fine tuning and agents, okay? These topics are kind of what, what the state of AI is today. So machine learning is, is kind of the traditional AI it's uh, statistical models, essentially, based off a bunch of data. You need a lot of data. You need to clean your data. It is a, it is a um, data science intensive endeavor. It's not for the faint of heart. If you have a company that has a lot of data, you probably are already using ML. <clears throat> and if you aren't, you probably should be. Now, raw LLMs is like if I just type into ChatGPT or if I just send a, a, a a text to OpenAI's API, and I say, hey, LLM, do something. LLMs are amazing, but they have a lot of weaknesses like hallucinations, they don't do good at facts. Um, there's a lot of problems. So to overcome those, some very smart person, I don't know who came up with this, I should look into it, and came up with this strategy called retrieval augmented generation. And what it does is it basically takes your data, your textual data, typically, and it turns it into vectors, which is a format that an AI can understand. And then when a user asks a question, it searches against all those vectors that it created, and it tries to find a match. It's not matching on the text. It's matching on the meaning of the text. So this is why AI is not that good at facts, because you can't do like straight text searches. Uh, yesterday, Tom was saying he tried to get a quote from William Gibson or something, and, and it wouldn't bring back a quote. It was hallucinating because it doesn't have the quotes stored in its, in its corpus. It has read the quotes, and it understands their meanings, and it knows that William Gibson's a person, but it doesn't really store all those specific quotes. It stored the meaning, and that's how the technology works, and this is why hallucinations happen. <laughs> so RAG is a technique that helps you get your data it helps you search your data, and then you send that back to the AI for it to synthesize. It's an amazing um, strategy, and it has tons of knobs and things you can turn to optimize it. Most significant applications today, at least for generative AI, are usually based on RAG. Otherwise, it's just a thin layer on top of an AI or, or a, a LLM. The next thing is fine tuning. Once, you've have, once you have a model in place uh, or an application in place and people are using it, then you can start to look at how they're using it. You can capture that data and you can use that data to fine tune the model itself so it performs better in your particular use case. So this is a more advanced topic. You get to this after you've done your first um, applications. And the next thing is agents. Agents is what everybody's doing right now. Uh, all the effort in Silicon Valley is going into agentic approaches. And this is yet another abstraction on top of the LLMs. So agents are essentially orchestrators. They're orchestrators, and they have a set of tools they can use. And so when you talk to the agent, you say, hey, I want you to do this thing. And the agent says, OK, what tools do I have at my disposal? And the agent has enough uh, intelligence, I guess, or it's using the sort of reasoning capabilities, however flawed, of the LLM to put together a plan to use those tools and deliver an answer. So this really, ba it's a basic idea, but if you start to kind of go down the road of where this could go, it becomes very advanced. We're talking about agents using agents using agents. Um, so you can imagine how complicated and kind of interesting this could be. When I build stuff with my team, I feel like this every day. Something will happen, we'll get the AI to do some amazing thing, and we're like, holy cow, I can't believe it did that. And then five minutes later, it does some stupid thing, and we're like, holy cow, I can't believe it did that. Like, why is it so dumb? Um, and I think this is, this is part of the new paradigm. In the old paradigm, it, it was logic. If the, if the app didn't perform the way you wanted, it was because you ha have a bug. You made a mistake in your logic. Now, there's a certain amount of randomness in Gen AI and also in the statistical, statistical models of machine learning that can get in the way of you know, perfection. So when it comes time for adoption, I think you have two viable approaches. One is top-down. That means you get a tiger team, you, get, you, know, you, you assemble your people, you get the smartest people in your 
organization, you identify some use cases, and you go after them. The other approach is bottom-up. You train everybody in your organization on how to use basic AI, the you know, ChatGPT, Copilot, et cetera. Um, let me go back into that, talk about that. The, 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 the great thing about going bottom-up is that what happens is you, every single person in your team starts to identify the use cases, all these little use cases. They are, they are improving their own productivity for their own gain. It's like a massive kind of Monte Carlo <laughs> simulation where all these people are working independently for their own good, and that bubbles up to the organization. Then you get some gurus in your org, and the gurus are the ones that have really embraced it and really driven it forward. They show the other people in the, in the team. And those people can become kind of some of your, you know, your black ops folks who then maybe join that bottom down or that top down approach to build apps. So it's a great, it's a great way to go about it. What, what's a mistake is to just go in the middle, is to kind of choose randomly. Like let's do some kind of fun thing or have your engineering team come up with something just because they can and not because it actually drives ROI in the business. So this idea of going wide, distributing, it to, distributing the technology to all of your team, having them generate the use cases, it's kind of usually the first good step. The next thing is going narrow. So uh, let's say your marketing team, they're using Gen AI, they're getting some value out of it, but they're like, hey, it won't do uh, what I want it to do. It only goes so far. I can't get it to do this more advanced thing. And so then you might look out into the market and say, well, what tools have been built already that are for this particular use case? Can I just buy that? And, and can that drive productivity in my whole function, not just personally? And then what you might do is you might use a tool like that and you say, hey, it's great, but it doesn't work for us in our particular industry or our particular company. So we need to build our own tools to get to that last gain. That's expensive. And so you have to be a lot more choosy about that. If you've done the other stuff, if you've gone wide and you've gone narrow, you're usually pretty smart at that point, right? And you're gonna make better decisions about building your own tool than if you just tried to jump to building your own tool. That could be a really expensive mistake. There's a lot of opportunity here right now because right now most companies do not have a well-trained AI workforce. Uh, 9% according to this survey. So there's opportunity to train your folks. I mean, I just think that's pure gain and it's so easy because it takes like, you know, an hour or two, two hours to learn some basic prompting. It takes a week to get fully trained and, and kind of like, you know, get productive with, with prompts. When I talked about that narrow column, can you read that? Can you see that? <laughs> These are all startups in the AI space. This is one of those landscape slides. I mean, this is insane. Right? Just in AI, there's a thousand, and this is probably just the best ones right, of, of that whole area. So it doesn't matter what your function is, there's somebody out there building an AI tool that can help you. So what works? When I engage with my clients, what works? Workshops work when we get the um, kind of the smartest people in the organization or the people that care the most, the leadership team, working together to start thinking through uh, the strategy. What, what should we do? Where, where's the value? You know, what's a dumb thing to do? What shouldn't we do? Those kind of workshops, half a day of investment with the right people can be very valuable. The next thing is tiger teams. Uh, assigning that, that function in more detail to small teams that can go out and, and work on it, like Trev was doing yesterday. Um, and crowdsourcing, actually seeking the wisdom of the crowd, the wisdom of your employees, to find those use cases and let those bubble up. What doesn't work, this is going to be a little controversial, so I'm sorry if you're a CTO in this audience, but letting your technical team drive the innovation by themselves, I find that's usually a mistake. The technical team isn't always aligned with what works for the business, and they tend to, they tend to fall into what's buildable rather than what the right thing to build is. The next thing that's a mistake is going supersized. Hey, we've never done anything with AI. Let's engage on a 12-month long project to completely transform our business into an AI-enabled, you know, it's like it's doomed, doomed. You have to start slow and start chipping away at it. Um, and the last thing is toys, building some novel, fun, cool thing that, you know, as a leader, you're like, look what I built, and then you can show it off, but it has no, it has no value to the business. That's why I said there's a big difference between building something 
and building the right thing. And that work that I talked about earlier is really about trying to find what is the right thing to build. My advice is to start with a strategy. It has to be coherent. The basic strategy has these three components. A policy. Do you have a policy at your organization? Your, your um, employees are going to be really nervous to use AI if you don't have a policy that clarifies what they should do. The next is, is there ROI on this thing? Can you measure success? And I wouldn't stick completely to ROI. I would also look at value more broadly. Can we move faster? Can we can we enjoy our jobs more? It doesn't have to be ROI alone. Uh, that can be a little bit of a, a, a too high of a bar at this stage in the technology. So be a little open to maybe like, hey, can we make this company a better company and, and not get totally fixated on the ROI at the moment? I believe it will come. You have to have a little bit of faith. And the last thing is uh, you know, permission. Give your team space to fail, you know, to try things out, to experiment. Don't set the bar so high that you know, they basically give up. Basic product strategy rules still apply. You have to align the effort of the thing that you're building or the, thing that the, 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 uh, the initiative with the strategy of the business. But you know, I say that, and it just seems so obvious. And it's, you know, it's obvious in this crowd as you look at it. But I can't tell you how many companies just don't do that. It's so simple. Amplify your advantages. There's a reason that you're successful in your business. You know, lean into those. How can AI support those things? Don't try and reinvent yourself to be somebody you're not just because you think AI can, you know, somehow magically make you better. And lastly is uh, to, to, to move, learn, and fail fast. I, there was someone yesterday that said, you know, don't do this fail fast thing. I totally disagree with that. I think you should fail, and I think you should fail as fast as you possibly can. Choose, uh, choose something that means is meaningful, that's going to move the needle for you, and work on that thing like for a month. And just give yourself a sense, can we pull this off or not? And if you fail in, in a month and you say, hey, now's not the right time, you wasted a month, no big deal. But if you try to build out this big project and spend six months, 12 months trying to build something out and it doesn't work out, that's, that's a big mistake. Okay. Now I've got two frameworks here for, for just how you, of any size business, can identify opportunities. So I say it's called looking for do. Do you have data? That could be numbers, that could be images, that could be telemetry, big pile of data. Do you have expertise? Is there somebody in your business that has knowledge in their head where if that person left, you would be screwed? Okay, that's expertise. And workflows, can you codify a workflow? Is there a workflow that is solid enough that it's like, yeah, we can document that workflow. If you have some aspect of your business that includes all three of those things, that's an AI use case. And you're probably thinking, well, shit, that's like everything. Yeah. There's a lot of use cases. I mean, uh, the thing is, it's hard for me. I was just talking to someone backstage. Um, I, I, like, I come in kind of as an AI expert, but I'm not a domain expert in anybody's business. So people say, what should I do with AI? I was like, I don't know. I don't know your business. But when I get to know your business, I can start to see the use cases. And I was like, oh, you know, my, my knowledge of AI, your knowledge of your business, we bring those things together and we can start to identify the use cases. And it's usually, this is what I do. I look for this stuff. Once you've got that list of opportunities, and it could be many, then you do the VVV framework, OK? Viability. How hard would it be to build this thing? Uh, and that doesn't mean just technically. There could be regulation. There could be cultural things. Uh, I did a project with an education company, and they just, you know, culturally, they were just like, we cannot put a, an, an LLM in front of an eight-year-old at this moment. And so we're like, OK, we'll have to find another way to do it. Um, value, this is the return on investment. I, and when I say the return, I'm going back to what I said earlier. It doesn't have to be money. It could be time. It could be satisfaction. It could be, you know, enjoyment of your job, happiness. And finally, velocity. How fast can you get it done? Because if it's going to take you 12 months, I don't think you should do it. You should break it down into some smaller aspect. The landscape is moving too fast. The tools are changing too quickly. I'm working on a project right now where we've already upgraded the model three times in the last like four months. So <laughs> if, we had known, if we had known four months ago that we were going to have a model as capable as the one we do now, we would have approached it totally differently. I mean, that's just going to happen. But it's just, an, it's just a, you know, an, it's an example of how quickly things are moving. Now, this is probably one of, one of the most important things that I can say. 
Um, if you are embarking, or if you've already embarked on your AI journey building AI things, the most important person on your development team is the subject matter expert. I believe they should be on the development team. You know, you have your engineers and your data scientists, and I think it's a big mistake to not have that person. Why? Because the engineers are going to be making decisions every day about how to develop this product, important decisions, and they don't know the subject matter well enough to make good decisions. If you're in the audience and you've done this before, I think you should be nodding your head at this point, right? Um, so ensure that the SME is involved, ensure that they are leading that, ensure that they have a voice in that development. And this is a paradigm shift. Developers don't like this. We usually have product managers, and product managers are the proxy to the SME. I'm saying no. You can have a product manager, you should also have the SME in there. And they should be a full cl first class member of that team. I said this already, I know it's controversial. Uh, I'm happy to, if someone wants to ask questions later and hit me back and say, hey, Ed, you're wrong, I'll, I'll argue this all day long, but uh, <laughs> I've seen it enough times, <laughs> so. Okay, I'll close with just a few basic thoughts. Some of this is summary. An AI policy, you have to have one. My advice, don't be so strict, don't be so like conservative that you basically tie everyone's hands. Come up with a policy that makes sense, that gives people permission to play, to innovate, to try new things. Yes, they're gonna fail. Maybe there's a little risk in that. That's, that's the way the world is right now. Number two, select projects with rigor. That means use those frameworks. Be really cautious about what you get into. Don't build toys. Find things that move the needle, but with ambition. You know, choose projects that are gonna make a difference. Choose projects that are interesting, that matter, that are core to your business. On the development process side, I think you should run lean, wide, and transparent. What does that mean? Run lean, that means have small teams. Small teams work faster and better than large teams. L large teams get bogged down in process and politics and stuff like that. Small teams for this kind of technology are much more effective. Good people working fast, they can collaborate with others, they can talk to each other, but just have them have the permission to be able to move fast and make decisions quickly. Um, wide, that means bring in voices from across the organization, share the work that you're doing, um, have beta testing, develop, put products in people's hands as quickly as you can if they're internal projects or you know, with beta testers if they're external projects. And transparent means share what you're doing with your organization, show the whole organization that you're working on these things so that they feel comfort. You know? When you do this in the shadows, people get nervous. They're like, oh, they're working on something that's gonna replace me. But when they see how the stuff actually works and how kind of difficult it is and how it's gonna improve their work rather than replace them, they're often more willing to engage and be one of those, be a participant in the development. Third thing, maybe this is uh, controversial as well, but I believe every company should just mandate AI adoption. Give everyone an account with ChatGPT. It's 20 bucks a month. You know, it's the same cost as Slack, basically. <laughs> but look at the powerful tool that you get. So this goes hand in hand with your policy. You need to make a sensible policy, and you need to give everybody the tool. A and this unlocks innovation and value all by itself. You, have to, you don't have to do anything. More uh, maybe controversial things. I think you should in innovate now, work uh, like separately from your current stack. Your, your current stack is probably the last generation of technology. The last generation of technology and this generation of technology don't always like fit together very well. And when you try to integrate it from the get-go, it causes all kinds of problems. It can, it can, uh, there's a lot of risk in messing up the things you've already built. So when you start off, just build something on the side. You can do things to you know, move data back and forth if you need to, but kind of resist the idea of fully transforming your existing stack right off the bat. Okay, why am I here? I'm a fancy Silicon Valley AI expert, all that stuff that Nadine said, right? But I think anyone that claims to be an expert right now is probably lying. It, it, it's too young, it's too new, it's moving too quickly, the playbook has not been written. And I say this all the time, you are gonna write the playbook. So I have something to offer, I, I wanna come be at the table and I want to talk about these things. I would love to talk to all of you about all of your use cases because I'm curious and I'm interested and it's fun to build this stuff and it's an amazing time to be alive and be participating in, in the building of the new paradigm. 
but you have to bring yourself up. So I hope that this presentation helped uh, a little bit educate you in these things. Again, credit where credit is due, the team that helped build this, who's not on here is the rest of my team at Machine and Partners, uh, amazing, creative people uh, who have been struggling with this technology for <laughs> years and will continue to do so moving forward, and obviously the AI that has helped us build this as well. Thank you, guys. Ed, or Ed, Ed, as you really nailed the Kiwi accent. Ed, Ed. Um, a really enlightening presentation and some great questions through, so if you do have some for Ed, please um, pop them through in the app and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, how can you start if, uh, if your data is not integrated across the organisation and possibly not that clean? Because you did identify some of the limitations of when your data isn't clean, right? Yeah, well, um, start small. Start small. Find, find data that uh, is the right kind of data and start playing with it. If you bring on, if you start to do machine learning, you're going to have to bring on a data science team. The data science team, this is their job. You know, clean the data. The, the harder part, so I think, uh, I say this all the time, but it's, it's usually not a technology problem, you know, it's, it, that's not the hard part. The technology is, is there to be solved. This is what technical people like to do. And so if you give them a juicy problem, they're going to go at it. The problem is usually choosing the right project. So that's kind of what you're getting at. Like, I, my, my question wouldn't be like whether the data is clean or not, is like, should you be using that data at all? And if it is, if you should be using it, and if that, if having that data in a machine learning model could drive value for your business, then if it's not clean, then clean it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the work of, of enabling this technology. Uh, you were, in your controversial closing thoughts, quite um, upfront about, let's not just leave this with the dev team. This is very much a, um, you know, the exec team, the leadership team, everyone needs to be on board with this. So there's a question here, should we be running an executive education sector session on AI before we embark on the AI journey? 100%. I mean, this is paradigm shifting. This is paradigm shifting. Okay, so if you go back to the 1996 and the beginning of the web, uh, you had all these people who were coming from like Pepsi and, uh, you know, McKinsey and stuff to run these new web companies, and they all failed because those people just did not understand the paradigm. And over time, we've all kind of you don't know this, but you're all kind of web experts <laughs> because we've been living with this technology for so long. Uh, but AI is new, so you do have to train up on how this works and how the paradigm works and, and where your expectations should be because you should be having conversations at the right level with your engineers. Otherwise, what happens is you say, hey, we're going to build this thing. Go build this thing. Engineers, go build it. They come back, and you're like, that's not the thing that I wanted, or this doesn't work the way I thought it was going to be, or, you know, my expectations were here, and the engineer says, technical, 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 and it's like, okay, well, then you, it's fail, you know, fail, starting over. So that's why having more information, like, understanding the technology, at, at, even at a cursory level, you don't have to go all the way down to, you know, how attention models work and transformers. You just need to know what all these different levers are, like that one slide with those things. If, if you just go home and talk to ChatGPT about those five topics <laughs> for, like, an hour or two hours, you'll be smarter than, like, 90% of the population on this stuff. Why don't we hear more about those other three things on the list? You know, we hear about machine learning, we hear about la large language models, but today was the first time I've ever heard about RAG, um, or the fine tuning or the agents. Like, is, is that just because it's only the sophisticated end of town that is using those particular tools, or what? Well, I can't explain RAG in 10 seconds, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and you don't know it, but every time you interact with ChatGPT, it's using RAG in the background. When you upload a document to ChatGPT, it's using RAG to handle that document and to answer questions about it. When you say summarize this article, it's using RAG to vectorize that article and give you the summary. And so the thing that's important about RAG, and the reason people don't know about it, is because there's like a complicated diagram that explains it, and it's a little bit hard for people to understand. So it, it's the kind of thing that's like, it is just a strategy, 
And so you look at it and you go, okay, well, it can, it can do that. But it's a strategy that has so many different avenues for how it works that if you don't know how, how it works, then when you're trying to make decisions about what the company should do, you, you're going to be like looking down a tiny keyhole of possibilities. RAG gives you an immense like, level of possibilities. If you don't know what's possible, then you're going to say, oh, let's try and do this, and your engineers will come back and say, okay, we'll do it. So just having that, having that information and that knowledge arms you to make better decisions. Mm. You talked about shyness to play. How do you overcome that when one of the things you also identified is sometimes you can be working on something, but the technology is moving so fast that by the time you've figured that out and implemented it and tested it and you're comfortable with it, the technology's moved on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, okay, it's, it's paradigm shift. It's paradigm shift moment. The way that we develop software before is different from the way that we're going to start developing software now. In the, the very um, obvious uh, example of this is like Cursor, these new AI-powered coding platforms. Developers are not even writing code anymore. They're, they're basically writing what they want the code to do, and Cursor writes it, and then they sort of qual quality check it, right? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's hard for people to like, get their head around this idea that the whole thing has changed. And so the risk has gone up a little bit, but the, the whole method that we develop has changed, right? And, and this is what is difficult. Because then expectations are based on the old paradigm. And so we say, hey, we, we expect you to build this thing and we want it to work. And, and that's not the way that you develop now. You work on something and you go, it kind of works. And then you go, great. Like, can we make it work better? And then the rest of your life, the rest of our lives are going to be trying to get AI to do a better job. That's the new paradigm. And, and I think it's hard for people to get their heads around that. And I guess it's also a big cultural shift to go from how you used to do things to this kind of innovative, fail-fast model, right? How do you create the culture where um, it's safe to fail and just move on? Yeah, I think you do it transparently. You celebrate, you celebrate these things. You, you ask people to try things. With the, if they fail, they say, hey, I tried it, and it didn't quite work out, but I learned something, then that's a win. Uh, and along the way, if you do 20 of those, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do that 20 times, you're going to get a couple of really good wins, like really actual wins, where productivity has increased. Uh, but you need to encourage people to keep, keep trying, keep playing, and, and keep sharing what they're doing. Like use your employees as a, as a hive, you know, uh, where they're encouraging each other, they're learning from each other, and the whole company benefits. Nigel says that Copilot deployed well is a silver bullet, which is a big claim. Why do you think more organizations haven't deployed it yet? Oh, uh, you know, cost. It's expensive. I, I don't, they don't know. Uh, again, again, old paradigm, like thinking with the old model, I have to, if I invest in this thing, I have to see a return on investment, and I want the number in a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, you know, every company is different. So one company might say, I deployed Copilot, and my productivity went up 20% based on my own measure. You might deploy it and not find that uh, for whatever reason, because you work differently than that company. So I think it's hard to make decisions like that. There's a little bit of faith. But again, if you're using it as the leader, and you're finding value or not, then you can make better decisions than if you're just sort of looking at some other company and sort of looking for statistics on ROI. Do you think it's a silver bullet? Uh, some com for some companies, it probably is like right out of the gate. If, you, if you've got a knowledge-oriented uh, workforce that um, is, is very textually based or does data analysis or things like that, a lot of writers, uh, you know, those kinds of functions, uh, it, can be, it can be a boon, yeah, right out of the gate. Um, Savannah would like to know, other than prompting, what else could be included in a company upskilling workshop on AI? Uh, I think looking, uh, what I might do is um, I would start with prompting. I would start with prompting and I would get everyone's hands dirty. And I, I know this is a weird thing to say, but uh, what happens in an organization is people start to get a feel for the technology, right? They, they start to have a, a, an understanding of it on a, an intuitive sense. And when you have that, then that allows you to then evaluate 
pre-built tools because there's always like a buy versus build moment at companies. And so you, you typically don't want to build. <laughs> you typically want to buy because it's a lot cheaper. Someone's built it and you, already they've done the expensive thing and you can just buy it for a fee. Um, but evaluating those, those tools is hard if you don't have that intuitive feel. Because you might look at the tool and say, oh, I could just do this with ChatGPT. I don't need to buy this expensive thing. <clears throat> or I built my own GPTs because I'm, you know, I'm a productive user of the, of the AI chatbots. And so <clears throat> then you have a better sense uh, organizationally of what's going to work and what's not. You make better decisions on the buying. Uh, and then you get further along, like I said, and then you're able to make better decisions on the building. So it's an evolution that takes time. You're not going like, to turn on training next week and then suddenly be like AI enabled and everything's going to work out great. Um, Casey would like to know, how can I best show ROI or value if I start small? Do you have any tips on how to get it across the line? As normally it's the bigger pieces of change with the bigger scale of return on investment that actually get approved. Yeah, so uh, th this is actually an approach that we use, it is to purposely stay small, demonstrate success. <clears throat> so find a metric that shows either confidence or predicts success on a larger scale on a small project. Okay, then your team can focus. They don't worry about these bigger topics. And having that confidence then allows you to pursue essentially change management. So when you get to a bigger organization, this becomes a change management problem. Everyone's stuck in their ways. They want to do it this certain way. If you start introducing new ways, people get grumpy. Um, and if the new way that you're introducing is so different that it requires training, it just becomes really difficult. But if you have confidence that this is going to be effective, that this small trial or this test or this proof of concept or whatever it is, even if it's a small product, if you have confidence that that is going to work and that you can extrapolate or extend that into the organization, then you're going to make, um, you're going to make that change management so much easier because you can demonstrate the value to the user. You know, when they, people adopt new things when it delivers value. If it doesn't deliver value, they're not going to adopt it. They'll just keep their feet stuck in the mud. As part of your approach of going wide, you suggested just get everyone in the organization a subscription so that they can use ChatGPT. Are there risks to that that business leaders need to be aware of if their staff are just like diving in, uploading company secrets to ChatGPT? Yeah, so paired with that is the policy. Mm. Um, so you, yeah, you would, I would never recommend like giving everyone ChatGPT without first giving, having a policy in place and making sure that everybody understands the policy. And then the second piece is the training. So just training people on how to use the tool. Uh, there's, a, there's that um, sort of learning curve where you, you know, it's, at first it's kind of cool. You'll show everyone, hey, look at all the cool things you can do. Oh, that's cool. And then they try and use it and they're like, oh, it doesn't work. I'm never going to use this again. And, and then 40% of your workforce will, will not touch that tool. But with the right training, you can get through that trough and you can get them up into like success mode where they see, ah, I might not be able to um, do amazing things at the moment, but I see that amazing things are possible if I work harder at this tool. That's where you want to get everybody. Um, Anna would like to know, for those of us who feel propelled to make sure New Zealand is ready and uses the technology to create an awesome future that provides tools that can impact accessibility and equity, how do we get you back to New Zealand and more people like you to help grow our own talent pool? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to leave. I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> stay, stay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My poor wife, I, I, last night in the hotel, I was like, oh. I, and then I went for a run on the water, and there's all these really nice people, and it's so beautiful, and I haven't even gone to the South Island, and look at this, my phone and the volcanic uh, island out there, I can't remember the name of it, sorry. Tiny Toto. Yes, uh, and my wife is just like, I hate you. <laughs> <clears throat> but no, I think, um, you know, uh, I think the honest answer to that, talent goes to where they're needed, talent goes to where the action is, and so if you... And where they're valued, right? And where, and where they're valued, yeah. So like Matt was saying, I mean, I, just, I can't, can't get over what, what he was saying. Is like, if you decide as a country that this is something that you want to do, that you really want to put effort into this and you want to put you know, money into it, then people will come because they will be like, hey, uh, they're doing something. And I've talked to folks here uh, 
individuals who are doing things that are like on par or way beyond many companies that I've talked to in the US, the US is just like everybody else, like, just like everybody in the world, there's not many people are actually moving hard and fast on this stuff. So there's all the startups, there's all the whole Silicon Valley thing, but as soon as you get past, you know, <laughs> the Central Valley of California and you start going east, uh, not, not a lot of innovation's happening that way. So if you say, hey, we're gonna make New Zealand an AI hub where a bunch of cool stuff is being done, people will come. Mm. Um, Richard would like to know, if you were able to teach your kids, and I know you've got a daughter, two to three things about AI right now, what would they be? Oh, I do have a 14-year-old daughter. She's not interested in AI at all. Um, <laughs> she loves to use it to cheat. She's very smart. All kids are smart, right? Um, so she is interested in it, but only for her own use case. <laughs> yeah, she found the value. <laughs> she found the value. It's like it writes my papers for me. Um, so, but I think, you know, what's interesting for her, and sometimes she's getting into this, she's starting to learn how to program. And so she can have conversations with Claude uh, on how to program. And what's amazing to, for me is to watch her have this conversation. Claude is a personalized programming tutor for her. Because I thought I was going to teach her how to program, right? I'm like, oh, I'll teach you how to program. She's like, no thanks. <laughs> I got this. Yeah, <laughs> I got this. And I was like, well, you can at least chat with Claude. Claude will sort of show you how to do it. And so she said, okay, well, I, I don't know if you guys know this watermelon game. Have you seen this mobile game? Fruits fall down, and anyway, there's, there's kiwis in there. Um, but it's a really fun game, and it's really simple. And so she decided she was going to learn to program watermelon. And so she asked Ch uh, Claude, hey, I want to program watermelon. And it said, okay, let's get started. And then she just started talking to it. And she's like, well, I don't understand what you're doing. And it's like, oh, okay, well, let me explain it and explain it to her. My mind was absolutely blown. She could be in a programming class at her high school for like a whole semester and get nowhere near the training that she got in like a few hours from interacting with Claude. I was just like, whoa. So I think, you know, playing with it, and uh, would, you said three things, I'm not sure I can conjure three things, but my, my sort of general philosophical advice is not to use it as a replacement for you, but to use it as a harness to move forward, right? So mm. if you want to write an essay, don't have it write your essay. Have it brainstorm with you about topics for your essay. How can you make your idea more interesting for your essay? Um, what, what twists can you put in your essay to make it more readable? Things like this, right? Sounds like you need a home-based policy on utilizing yes, I do. AI, That's a great right? idea. That's a great Not idea. Not just appropriate in the workplace. I'll have to pin it up on the wall with nails or something. Right? Yeah, exactly. Look, we are going to be talking to Edmundo in our panel a little bit later as well. But for now, please put your hands together for Edmundo Ortega. Thank you so much.